welcome to the Explaining History podcast and today we're going to focus on the first defeats of the Italian army in North Africa uh, inflicted uh, upon Mussolini's armies by the British in 1940. This, of course, is a tale of arrogance and hubris that uh, befits the Duce and the lack of foresight and the poor preparation for war, and the fact that throughout the 1930s, various forays into Abyssinia and Spain had depleted the financial reserves and the material preparation that the Italian army and navy needed meant that the Italian forces in North Africa would suffer catastrophic defeats to a far, far smaller British Empire force. Now, a month or two ago, I did a podcast on the preparations by Mussolini and the preparations by the British for conflict in North Africa and Britain's plans to defend the Suez Canal. If you want to stop and go listen to that, that'll make a whole lot more sense about this podcast. But if not, then listen on and I'm sure you can catch that one later on. In Libya to the west and in Abyssinia to the south, the Italians possessed vast numbers of troops. There were 600,000 Italian and colonial troops in both uh, Italian possessions, and these were poised to uh, expel the British from Egypt with the greatest of ease. Churchill's least favourite general, Archibald Wavell, was sent to conduct the defence of Egypt, and under his command in uh, Egypt and in East Africa in general, there were less than 100,000 British and colonial troops, Um, and all this also included troops in the Middle East, um, Sudan and Somaliland and Kenya. Uh, So the Middle Eastern sector was uh, very, very lightly garrisoned compared to the threats that faced it. And this was demonstrated when British Somaliland fell without almost a shot being fired um, to their Italian neighbours in Italian Somaliland. And this was the kind of conquest that Mussolini was looking for. Quick, easy without uh, expending large amounts of um, blood and treasure and conserving the munitions and equipment uh, that were uh, Mussolini had uh, access to. The hope that Mussolini had was that Britain would capitulate soon anyway, that the uh, bombing of Britain and perhaps even an invasion of Britain might take place, and very swiftly a peace conference would be called in which Mussolini would appear on the victorious side and would take a disproportionate share of uh, imperial assets from Britain compared to the amount of effort and fighting the Italians had actually put in. Max Hastings in All Hell Let Loose reports that one Italian journalist wrote We want to reach the Suez with our own forces alone. Perhaps we will win the war, not the Germans. And it's easy to write these things off as deluded, which certainly they are, but it also tells us an awful lot about the perspectives of people at the time. The British were under no, by no means convinced that they would hold Egypt. They were under no means convinced that they would hold the Suez Canal. British uh, armies would fight to the death to maintain it, uh, to uh, maintain access to Suez, and Churchill would have um, ordered innumerable divisions into battle, every man he could have laid his hands on to make sure that Suez didn't fall. But in 1940, there was no um, belief that necessarily the centre would hold, and it was also highly plausible that the Italians might seize um, Egypt, from an Italian perspective, this seemed like an an easy victory in the offing. Mussolini had already sabotaged his military capability. He had allowed part of his army to be demobilised in order to return home to bring in the uh, Italian wheat harvest, 
the obsession that Mussolini had with grain and grain quotas and expanding the amount of arable land also tied in with the fact that the many of his soldiers were sons of peasants and the modernisation of Italy had not really reached large parts of the rural south. This meant that the needs of bringing in the harvest and the, the cycles of um, rural life still had a huge significance when it came to removing large numbers of troops from the, uh, from the countryside. Not only had Mussolini had failed to seize Malta, which was in the hands of Great Britain and would be a resupply base for British ships crossing the Mediterranean to connect um, Egypt up with Great Britain, but Malta would also be a key uh, airfield for British bombers and anti-submarine aircraft and everything else in the skies that Axis forces really didn't want to see. He planned operations in both Greece and Yugoslavia and instead of concentrating his energies on one task, uh, Mussolini in his particularly erratic and um, characteristically impulsive manner made sure that his attempts to see his territory spanned both Europe and North Africa. This was a crucial mistake. Forced concentration is vital when taking on a technologically advanced enemy such as Great Britain that was entrenched and had the opportunity and had the advantage of being the defender. Max Hastings again writes... An Italian diplomat vented his disgust on the mood he encountered during a visit to Milan. Everyone thinks only of eating, enjoying themselves, making money, and relaying witticisms about the great and powerful. Anyone who gets killed is a jerk. He who supplies the troops with cardboard shoes is considered a sort of hero. A young Italian officer wrote home from Libya. We're trying to fight this war as though it were a colonial war in Africa, but this is a European war with European weapons against a European enemy. We take too little account of this in building our stone forts and equipping ourselves with such luxury. In many ways, the campaign in Africa was fascism's ideological chickens coming home to roost. The chaos and the corruption of Mussolini's regime had meant that the uh, profiteering uh, that went on in Italy uh, that involved um, the supplying of inadequate equipment to uh, Italian soldiers in North Africa and the embezzlement of large sums of public money, along with the boasts and the uh, wild, overly optimistic projections of Mussolini, who believed as Hitler did, but with uh, even less um, rigour, that simply the will to fight and obey would be enough to see men over the top and into action against the British, and that concepts such as planning, logistics, supply chains, and the adequate equipment of an army moving across a desert uh, really were irrelevant, that this would be a defining moment in Italian national history and that martial vigour uh, would shape Italians. Um, war, struggle and bloodshed would really forge the nation into um, a, a, a mighty warrior people. All this is, of course, complete fantasy, and the um, wars are not won on willpower alone, or really willpower at all. Wars are really are won on logistics, production, supply chains, and the ability to get uh, fuel, food, equipment and munitions to men when they need it. Hitler, as a gesture of solidarity with his Axis ally, offered uh, Mussolini two armoured divisions to uh, help him in North Africa, which would perhaps have pushed all the way through to the Suez Canal. One of Mussolini's main problems uh, was lack of armour and transport. Mussolini dismissed this, and he didn't want the Germans from taking 
any part of his, what he could perceive as being his victory. However, in a moment of particularly poor judgment by Mussolini, one quarter of the entire Italian air force had been sent to join the Luftwaffe in its attack on Great Britain. And one of the deciding factors in the uh, brief desert war that Mussolini attempts to fight against Britain was lack of air support. The uh, Italian army is virtually defenceless from the skies. Mussolini kept forces in the rear in Albania to attack Greece or Yugoslavia. And these are, of course, troops who would have been highly useful uh, fighting in the desert. Mussolini was afraid that a deal between Britain and Germany would be made before he could make serious um, inroads into uh, the British Empire in North Africa. And the race to take territory from Britain led him into his greatest military fiasco uh, of the war, in which 26 divisions, half the Italian Air Force, the entire force of Italian tanks, um, and any, any illusion that Mussolini was a serious player in the war, uh, were lost. Mussolini's most senior military commander in North Africa was Marshal Rodolfo Graziani, um, who in uh, the summer of 1940 commanded half a million men in Libya, facing 36,000 British troops in Egypt, and uh, backed by a further 27,000 men in Palestine. Graziani himself had committed what we would now term crimes against humanity in 1935, uh, dropping poison gas on the uh, Abyssinian people, and he was far more suited to uh, easy wars of conquest against far weaker enemies than he was to a fight against a, a well-equipped and motivated force, even one which was dwarfed by his own, his own uh, retinue of troops. Marshal Graziani was cautious when it came to advancing. The British had already led cross-border raids against the Italians for information and prisoners, and he was not sure whether he really felt like taking on um, the British at all. At the insistence of Mussolini, Graziani leads an attack and he is certain that the British have more men. Quite unnecessarily, he digs in at Sidi Barani, which sits on the coastal road from Libya into Egypt, about 95 kilometres across the border. And it was uh, an incredibly cautious uh, move. It was one which was going to be ultimately unsuccessful, and it showed that uh, Graziani had very little understanding of warfare, of how armies moved, and how easy it was along this tiny strip of um, navigable land on the northern coastal uh, northern coastline of North Africa to be outmaneuvered and encircled. Graziani stopped at Sidi Barani for three months. Uh, Mussolini, furious, demanded that there be action, demanded there be movement, desperate that something happen, some defeat of the British occur before the war came to an end. Um, Churchill was also demanding some kind of victory following Dunkirk and following the re removal of the British expeditionary force from Europe. He was certain that... North Africa had to be the place that the battle was taken to the Axis, and it had to be the place that the British were given their first great victory, and this would bring up morale and keep Britain in the war. More importantly than this, Churchill also had to present a success to Roosevelt. Roosevelt, who Churchill was so keen to eventually bring into the war and to keep a supply of credit and of uh, munitions crossing the Atlantic to Britain, and it was important that the American public saw that the British were able to fight back and were not a lost cause. In January 1941, um, the British army in Sudan marched into uh, Italian-occupied Eritrea, a part of Abyssinia, uh, and seized a fortress at Keren um, in a battle uh, which began on, on the 27th of March, um, which, cost, which was a very costly battle to the British, 
killing 500 soldiers and leaving over 3,200 uh, 3, uh, wounded. In February that year as well, February 1941, um, the British Army advanced from Egypt under one of the most successful um, generals of the war, who was later, unfortunately for him, captured, um, General Alan Cunningham, who marched from uh, Kenya into um, Abyssinia and seized the capital, Addis Ababa, ending the, uh, the occupation of Italy in Abyssinia, which had begun in 1935. So the first quick victory of the war didn't go to Mussolini. It went to Great Britain, or the first quick victory of the war, shall we say, in North Africa and the Middle East. One thing is always not worth noting with these kinds of campaigns that while combat deaths were very low, uh, the British saw some 75,000 men succumb to sickness, um, and of which 744 died. Even uh, cases of diarrhoea and uh, gastric illness and that sort of thing that aren't life-threatening can leave uh, valuable fighting men out of action for considerable periods of time, so much so that they have to be counted as uh, non-combatants. The Italians lost 300,000 troops uh, taken prisoner. While the Italian Empire in Abyssinia was busy being destroyed, the most significant move came against Graziani when Wavell and uh, Lieutenant General Sir Richard O'Connor launched Operation Compass against Sidi Barani. When it became clear that Italian defences were extremely weak, Italian troops were uh, almost, in some cases, unarmed, they hadn't eaten, were thirsty, demoralised, hungry and ready to surrender in large numbers. The scope of the operation dramatically increased. The British Imperial forces advance into Libya, um, taking huge numbers of prisoners, um, moving very, very quickly. And it's this speed which is the key to their success. They were motorised. Um, the British army moved around, moved the troops around in lorries, um, with jeeps, and were supported by light tanks. And this also meant that they could move large quantities of water around too. These were some of the things that Mussolini had neglected to provide his troops with in sufficient quantities. However extraordinary these victories seemed, Skilled military onlookers uh, in the Soviet Union, in America, and in the Axis powers saw them for what they were uh, relatively insignificant. And they were insignificant particularly because at this point they didn't feature the Germans, and that any fight between Britain and Italy was inevitably going to be a sideshow, and any struggle between Britain and Germany before Barbarossa was going to be uh, decisive in the outcome of the war. This was not how people in Britain saw it. There was a great deal of excitement and rejoicing at victories over Italy in North Africa, and it did do a significant amount to uh, augment uh, British national pride. There was a great deal of interest in the war in North Africa, and by February, early February, O'Connor's army had moved 500 miles from its start point, and following the fall of El Aquila, uh, the road to Tripoli was open and British troops looked poised to conquer all of Libya. In a later podcast, I'm going to talk about the disaster for the British army in Greece and Crete. And it was a uh, particular tragedy because as, as O'Connor's army raced across uh, Libya to seize Tripoli, it ground to a halt as Churchill ordered four divisions, including the New Zealand division and much of the Australians, to Greece in order to defend the country which, seemed, which was seemingly indefensible. This wouldn't be the first or the last time in the war that Churchill's personal intervention led to unnecessary and catastrophic setbacks. The timing was particularly unfortunate as the German Africa Corps had been dispatched to aid Mussolini 
and to prevent the collapse of Mussolini in North Africa, led by the uh, maverick German general Erwin Rommel, about whom we'll hear more uh, later on. The British supply line was also enormously overstretched, as we will see with North Africa, and there's a great deal to be said on the, on the subject, um, and this will take a, another few podcasts to finally uh, work our way completely through. There would be a, an elastic campaign of uh, stretching supply lines on both sides, and when the British left Egypt and made their way um, through Libya, uh, the, their supply line extended to breaking point. So, and the moment that success was closest, as they closed on Tripoli, the army started to grind to a halt. It began to lose manpower to the defence of Greece, and it also began to f- um, find it harder and harder to resupply itself, and a powerful new enemy was being uh, unloaded at the docks of Tripoli itself. The Abyssinia campaign, whilst it had been swift and successful, it had seized a large amount of territory which had to be garrisoned by British and Commonwealth troops, which was of questionable value. It had been of questionable value to Mussolini. And the British had become used to fighting Italians who were poorly led, poorly trained and poorly motivated. And they were in for something of a shock when the Africa Corps entered the battlefield, particularly with 88mm artillery, which could destroy British tanks from a safe distance. One success that Operation Compass had was quite unintended. It kept Spain out of the war. Franco, in 1940, had been weighing up the possibility of throwing his lot in with Hitler. Hitler had a meeting in the Pyrenees upon his, uh, aboard his train with Franco, in which Franco essentially asks for vast amounts of North African territory for, to be transferred from Vichy France to him uh, in return for his participation in the war. Some fairly minor stuff, such as seizing Gibraltar, and Hitler couldn't do this, knowing that he had a, to placate his new Vichy France ally, and that Franco was asking for an awful lot in return for not very much. Franco wanted to make sure that the British had been already defeated by Germany and possibly Italy before he risked anything. And the fact that O'Connor had led such a spectacular uh, defeat of Italy in Sidi Barani and into Libya made uh, Franco very, very cautious indeed. Mussolini had his eye on the same French colonies in Africa and was keen for Franco not to be involved. And when plans to seize Gibraltar using a Spanish and German combined force um, were shelved, it was because in February 1941 Hitler was beginning to see the entire Mediterranean theatre as an irritant and a sideshow and, of course, was starting to turn his attentions to Russia. A Spanish intervention in the Second World War would have doomed Gibraltar. It would probably also have doomed Malta as well, and would have lost the British um, any chance of controlling the Mediterranean. Uh, This would mean that the resupply of British Egypt would have become virtually impossible, and the chances of the entire Middle Eastern sector falling would have been greatly increased. So Operation Compass, whilst it was dismissed by some onlookers as being um, looking very grand but having little substance, actually potentially saved the British in the Middle East and perhaps even Britain's war effort in its entirety. Because without the Middle East... Of course, there would have been very little oil in order to fuel Britain's war effort that didn't ship itself across the Atlantic from the United States. Thanks for listening, and I'm going to continue looking over the next few weeks at the Desert War. Um, So if you like that, if you find it interesting, 
Of course, uh, give us some good feedback, say hi on the Facebook page, pass it on to a friend, or even better, give us a thumbs up on the iTunes uh, Explaining History page. Many thanks, and I'll catch you on the next Explaining History podcast. Bye-bye.